Welcome to Saturday's keynote session. It's my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Carlini, who is a research scientist at Google Brain, where he uh, researches the security and privacy of machine learning. And for this line of this general area of research, um, he's been awarded a, num a number of times for best paper, um, including at I uh, ICML and IEEE uh, S&P Security and Privacy. He received his PhD from the University of Berkeley at California. I believe his advisor was David Wagner, right? Nicholas is, I think, one of the bright young minds in our industry who is able to um, legitimately connect security and machine learning. And he's done as much as anybody, I think, in our industry to bring that security mindset to the machine learning field. For all of you who have done a little bit of adversarial machine learning, uh, you'll note that Nicholas Carlini is the Carlini in the CW Carlini Wagner attack, which uh, is, he named it after himself, I assume, or somebody else did. Um, I think you will hear a, a bit more about that general line of research in our, during our keynote today. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Nicholas Carlini. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction, Hiram. This is still working, yes? Good, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I'm from the academic space, and I figured what I'd try and do is tell you a little bit about what's going on over there that's interesting and I think is relevant for most of the people here. And I realized sort of that I've titled this talk maybe the most academic way I possibly could. Uh, maybe the only exception would be like if I gave it like a towards evaluating or something. <laughs> but um, I promise I'm not going to throw a bunch of equations at you. I'm really going to try and actually introduce useful things to all of you. Uh, so maybe to get things started, um, this is an image of a cat. Uh, all of us recognize this correctly as a cat. It's pretty obviously a cat to all of us and any human in the world. Um, but it turns out that we can introduce a very small perturbation, it's called an adversarial perturbation, to get this new image over here, so that this image is now incorrectly recognized by the same neural network that gets the one over there right with 88% confidence, it gets the other one wrong with 99% confidence as the label guacamole, which is obviously wrong if for no other reason than because these are just the same thing. Like, I don't need to know that this was a cat, I, I just need to know these are the same. Uh, so, okay, so, so like I promised that like we'd talk about like some, some things that we've learned in the research space. Uh, so maybe the lesson we've learned is like, you know, um, just like don't classify cats with neural networks. Um, <laughs> cats are special. No, cats and neural networks don't mix, don't classify cats. Um, well, you know, I, I could have just done it like any other way, I could have done this. Um, and now we have guacamole that has turned into a tabby cat and this like works just as well. And so, okay, you know, the mathematician in me is trying to find like the least restrictive set, and so maybe I say like don't classify cats or guacamole with neural networks, but you know, this obviously, you see where this is going, um, here's a stop sign. All of us recognize this as a stop sign, but a state-of-the-art neural network in recognizing street signs sees this as a 45 mile an hour sign, and now is just going to go right through the intersection and speed up while it does so. Um, so there's obvious security implications of these problems with neural networks. Um, so at this point, you know, maybe, okay, um, you know, maybe it's just images. Maybe images are a hard thing. Um, so maybe we can do other stuff but not images. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to play some audio. Uh, tell me what it is that you think the person is saying. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table. So what do you think that said? <laughs> okay, guacamole, no, the answer is not guacamole, but the answer is not what you think. So what you thought you heard was most of them were staring quietly at the big table. Um, the true transcription is, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. Which is obviously wrong if for no other reason than it's just too much text there. Like, the person couldn't possibly have said that in as few words as they did. Um, but again, state of that neural network is convinced in this. Um, so, I mean, you know, like, you know, maybe it's just images and audio. Well, you know, like the research space um, sort of has taken off and people have done these kinds of attacks 
on anything you can imagine, ranging from natural language processing to reinforcement learning policies, neural machine translation. We have sequence to sequence models, segmentation. Basically, anything where you use machine learning, these kinds of attacks work. They work in different ways, but they're effective basically everywhere. Uh, yeah, okay, so like at this point, you know, maybe I just, I've learned my lesson, just like give up. Um, we just should never use machine learning. I end my talk and we just like all go on with our lives and agree we're never gonna use machine learning again. Um, okay. um, so yeah, you know, like obviously that's not gonna work. Um, we actually, like we all agree that we're here. We know machine learning is important. And so like we need to do something with it. Um, and so like after just wasting the last five minutes of my talk, what I figured I'd actually do uh, is tell you what lessons we've actually learned in the research space about evaluating the robustness of defenses to adversarial examples. And the way I'm gonna go about this talk is sort of backwards. I'm gonna start by talking about how we generate adversarial examples. Uh, then I'm gonna go into the defenses about adversarial examples. Uh, then I'm gonna go and talk about what it means to evaluate the robustness of the defenses to adversarial examples. And finally, the lessons we've learned from evaluating the robustness of those defenses to adversarial examples. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's get started with um, how we generate adversarial examples. Because I showed you a bunch of examples of, of what we can do, but I didn't actually say how we generate them. And so what I'm gonna do now is explain that very briefly. Uh, so, okay. What I'm gonna show you here is this is the plot of the decision boundary of a neural network that does image classification. So, uh, each color corresponds to a particular classification of a different type of object. Um, so the point in the middle is the classification of some kind of dog. Um, for those of you who know what the CIFAR-10 data set is, this is CIFAR-10 images. These are very small, low-resolution images drawn from 10 classes. So this point in the middle is dog. As I add noise, random noise going in one axis, maybe along the y-axis, I'm gonna get something that looks like this, which is a really noisy version of that dog, which is misclassified as truck. Okay. Um, this is not an adversarial example. Um, no person would say that this is the same as that. Um, they're very different. I've added a lot of noise to make the thing misclassified. Um, but I've, and I've moved quite far, and the classification has changed. Like, sort of, I've gone from this light blue region to that dark blue region. So that's what happens when I move, adding random noise in one direction. And I do the same thing, adding random noise in the other direction. And so as I move away from this input image, it gets like a noisier and noisier version of it. But you'll notice that like, if I were to draw a box around the center of like, the things that are nearby, I'd find that all of them are correctly classified. And so you might think that this is good, like this neural network is robust, um, it, there are no adversarial examples on this, on this image. Um, the problem though is that you have to realize that this is just two random dimensions that I've chosen. Uh, I've chosen to go randomly in this towards that image and randomly towards some other image. Um, it turns out that I could have picked a different direction and the image would have looked something like this instead. Where now, I go, when I go up, the same thing happens. So like I'm, I'm going up the same way where I'm adding this sort of noise to get this truck, but now I go along the other direction and I change that. So instead of adding random noise, I add noise of like the worst case flavor. And that means that this new image is now very, very close in the distance space, but has crossed the decision boundary of the neural network. It's no longer classified the same way and now this thing over here is an airplane. And so this really is sort of fundamentally what's going on. And so if we were to draw the same box, we would find that like half of the space is adversarial. And that's really fundamentally what the problem is, is that while in random directions, neural networks are incredibly robust, when you travel in the worst case directions, they're not robust at all. Um, okay, so to give a little more intuition about why it is that this can happen, like how is it that we have, that we can move very, very close and nothing changes, let me extend this plot to be three-dimensional. Uh, and the way I'm gonna make it three-dimensional is I'm going to make the height, the z-axis of this same plot correspond to the confidence of the neural network in its correct prediction. Um, okay, so here's the plot, let me say that again. This is the same plot as before, where the, the, the surface looks the same, everything is colored the same way, but now the height corresponds to the confidence of the neural network in the correct prediction. Neural networks give how, how likely they think the output is, and I've plotted that confidence as the height. So for example, the original image is at the very peak. It's correctly classified as dog. And what you see is that as we move away, 
along one direction, like the like it's sort of like flat. You, nothing really happens. But if you go in the other direction, like it really is like we're falling off the face of this mountain. And finding adversarial examples here is really quite simple. We just sort of walk down the hill, and we end up finding a place where the confidence in the correct label is basically zero, and the confidence in the incorrect label of airplane is really high. Um, and so adversarial examples basically work, uh, are generated in this way. You generate some kind of surface, you perform what's called gradient descent, you walk down the lost surface, and you end up um, with something which is misclassified um, as whatever label you want it to be. Okay. Uh, so, that's adversarial examples and how we generate them. Um, now let me tell you about defenses to adversarial examples. Um, so in the space of defense, uh, of adversarial examples, the defense satisfies two properties. Uh, the first thing it has to do is it has to actually be accurate on the test data. Uh, we want the defense to get things right on, when the original model got things right also. Uh, but also we want it to, to actually be robust to these kinds of attacks. Um, and that's what it really means to be secure here. Um, so, let me give you a couple examples. Um, maybe the first natural thing that you might think of uh, is something that we call adversarial training. Um, so, you might come, up, come across this idea because the claim is that like, neural networks don't generalize. Um, they only know how to classify what they've seen. So, maybe we just show them lots of adversarial examples and make it learn to classify those ones correctly. Uh, so, you know, maybe standard training works something like this. You know, you take your, your image of a seven, label seven, feed it into the training algorithm, image of a three, label three, feed it in, and you get out of this some neural network. Uh, so that's standard training. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an attack algorithm, any attack algorithm you want. We're gonna feed in our image of a seven with the label seven and say, give me something that's wrong. And it'll give out this perturbed seven. And then we do the same thing for the three. Give me a bad version of this three and we get out an adversarial version of the three. Um, we then just copy these things over to the training data. Um, we give them the label that was the correct thing. We label the seven as seven, we label the three as three, and then we just perform this again. We train on the original seven, we train on the original three, we train on the adversarial seven, we train on the adversarial three, we get a new neural network and we repeat this process as many times as possible um, until eventually it converges. And the hope is this gets something good. Um, okay, so that's, that's one kind of defense. Uh, maybe the other kind of defense that you might think of is that maybe adversarial examples are somehow brittle. Um, they only work on the exact network that you've trained them on. And so what we'll do is we'll take our image, we'll pass it through some random transformation. You know, maybe we're gonna rotate it or skew it or crop a little bit off of the sides, and then we'll classify that, that, that rotated, skewed, cropped image. And maybe that removes the adversarialness of the original image. Um, or, you know, maybe we like JPEG compress it or we do something else which is going to modify the original image so that we've like removed this adversarial piece while keeping the image looking fundamentally the same. Okay. Um, so this is quite a, kind of two examples in the wide space of all the things you could do for adversarial example defenses, um, but I think they nicely capture the kinds of things that have been going on in the research space. Um, okay. So, um, given those defenses, how do we actually evaluate them? So, I guess the first question is like, what does it mean to perform an evaluation? Uh, so, in standard machine learning, it's very easy. You know, you take your model, you train it on the training data, um, you then compute the accuracy on the test data, and then you say like, is it good enough? If it's greater than some accuracy threshold, then you say yes, and if no, then like, keep tuning hyperparameters or something. And this is what we do. Uh, this is very easy as long as you don't just like train on the test set in machine learning, you're safe. Like you, basically the only thing that can go wrong in a standard machine learning evaluation is training on the test set. And there are some details, but as long as you don't do that, by, by, by a way, like you're safe. Okay, um, so and like this is the key piece of the evaluation. Like um, don't just mess with that and, and everything's fine. Okay, so what does it mean to do an adversarial machine learning evaluation? Everything else stays the same. The only thing we're gonna change um, is we're going to change this one line here that looks that used to look like this and now looks like this. Where all we've done is we said that we're going to attack the test data before we classify it um, with some attack function A that gets to, gets to see access to the model. So given the model and given the, given the new test data, it wants to generate new examples that are misclassified. Okay, so this is really all that it is that we need to do. 
Um, but the problem here is that this is sort of a universal quantifier over all possible attacks. Like, it's not that I have to, like, defend against the adversary who does the worst possible attack, uh, maybe just does nothing, uh, but they have to do, like, the strongest possible attack that any person could ever think of. Uh, and that kind of works across all possible attacks is really, really hard. So, um, how complete are the evaluations that are actually done in the research space. Um, so as a case study, let me tell you about what happened uh, at this conference called iClear, one of the three main machine learning conferences uh, last year. Um, so um, there were a bunch of papers that were submitted. Um, these, of the ones that were accepted, um, I'm sort of showing the papers and color coding in red the parts of the papers that were evaluation. Um, most papers spent roughly half their space trying to perform an evaluation. And these were papers from really great places, um, places like Facebook, like Google, like UT Austin, um, like Purdue. They had like, very good authors on them. They knew what they were doing. Um, they spent a lot of work on it. Um, and the question is, like, how strong were these evaluations? Were they complete? And OK. So uh, we reevaluated them and tried to see what we could find. And, okay, so we placed four of them out of scope um, because for various reasons they like, sort of didn't fit the threat model we cared about and so we didn't want to analyze them. Um, of the remaining ones, two of them are going to be what I call correct uh, in that um, they don't offer perfect security but the claims that were in the paper um, we couldn't invalidate. Um, it may be the case that they're actually not secure but I'm not going to say that it's broken if I couldn't actually break it or no one else currently has. Um, so these ones are correct. Uh, and the other seven were broken and basically offered zero robustness. And so the question then is, like, what happens that makes you think, like, these papers were accepted at a strong academic conference written by great people out of great places, like, why were basically half of the papers at this conference wrong? Um, so what happened? Uh, well, I showed you this image earlier. This is a standard neural network cloth surface where like, it's easy to perform gradient descent and go down the hill. Uh, basically what these defenses did is transform the loss surface to make it look something like this. Where it's a little hard to see here, but um, this is a really, really, really noisy version of the other thing. Globally it looks very similar, but locally it's very hard to tell what's going on. And so an algorithm that tries to mount an attack that can only see local information just has no idea of what it's trying to do and just completely fail to generate adversarial examples. And so most of these papers claimed that their defense was effective. So let me just zoom in on one part just to sort of show you what the, what the algorithm would have seen. The algorithm would have seen something that looks like this, which, like, if, you, if I were to show you this image and say, like, which direction should you travel in to minimize, like, the function, like, you know, if I were on this side of the hill or that side of the hill, like, it would, like, very, very small perturbations make a huge difference on where you would end up going. The algorithm essentially just spins around in circles forever until you stop it, and it doesn't find anything interesting. So that's what these kinds of defenses essentially had done. Uh, many people didn't actually realize that's what happened, um, but in, in effect, that's what these defenses had done. Um, now, I should mention that like, this is not the first time that this has happened. Like, it's fairly common that papers are written that keep on being broken, um, people like in the space write paper after paper that are defenses and people go through and just break them one by one. Um, this happens a lot. And so it's not like this one conference that had a problem, it's like the space as a whole is, it's, performing these evaluations is really hard. So, um, okay. Um, that's what evaluations, the state, of they are, the state with that they were, um, what can we actually learn from these kinds of evaluations? And, there are basically three things that we can learn from these evaluations. Uh, so the first thing that we can learn is like what kinds of defenses are effective. Maybe this is like the most high level piece of information. Um, so of the defenses that worked, um, we can sort of classify the, them into categories. Um, so the first class of effective defenses um, is adversarial training. Um, this is the one that I showed first where you just keep on retraining on the adversarial examples until it starts getting them correctly. Okay. Um, so that's good. So th this is one thing that works. It has problems. You need to know what kinds of attacks people are going to implement. You don't need to know the exact attack, but you need to know the style. 
if you get the style of attack wrong, then the neural network is not, gonna, not going to learn it, and they're going to be fooled in the same way. Uh, but, you know, it mostly is, is okay. Uh, okay, so then, like, the second... Oh, wait, oh, I, should, I should mention, actually, so standard neural network does this, um, where, like, the decision surface looks like this. The one that's all messed up looks like this. Adversarial training makes the function look like this, where we notice that, like, there is a region which is misclassified, but it's been moved farther away. But nicely, like, the surface is really, really flat. And so I'm relatively convinced that I'm not just messing with the loss surface and making the attack hard. I actually believe that this kind of function is actually robust because, you know, it looks, like, really easy to take gradients over, and so I think that I know how to find adversarial examples here. Um, all right, so that's, like, sort of the first class of defenses. Um, maybe the, sort of the second class of defenses is basically the empty set. Um, we have no other defenses that are effective. Um, <laughs> And maybe the claim here I should make is that people have proposed many other defenses. No one else has analyzed another defense and found it to be effective. Um, all of, like, there are like, something like 300 defense papers out there. And I'm, I'm not going to say that none of them work. What I'm going to say is that of the subset of those that have been reanalyzed by someone else, the only style that seems to work is adversarial training. Um, everything else that gets analyzed gets broken. Um, so if you need secure machine learning today, the answer is probably adversarial training. Okay, so that's sort of the first lesson of like a very high level. If you want robust classifiers, use adversarial training. Um, maybe the next lesson is like what we've learned like on from these evaluations and how to do evaluations a little better. So I sort of showed you this image. I showed you this image and said that like this was hard to compute gradient descent over and therefore it was robust. I didn't tell you, I sort of asserted without telling you that it's broken, but I didn't tell you why. And so let me get into that now and tell you why it is um, that this thing here doesn't actually work. And basically the reason why is that while it's true that locally this thing looks really ugly, like it's hard to actually compute gradients here, um, if you look globally, this function looks basically the same as this one here. Like, you know, there's this blue region and it has a peak at the top. You go off to the right and you're misclassified into this green region. And the important thing that I hadn't told you earlier is that, remember when I said I picked two random, like one random direction and one adversarial direction? The adversarial direction on these two classifiers is the same direction. So it's not that I picked the worst case direction here and the worst case direction there. I picked the worst case direction here in a random direction and just computed the same plot for this function. And it turns out that the worst case direction on this regular classifier was actually pretty bad for this secure classifier. So while it's hard to compute gradients here and like know which direction down is, if I just were to copy the answer that this classifier gave me, I get pretty good, um, I get pretty close to the actual answer. And so in a little more detail, um, what we do to actually mount this attack is, um, well, okay. So, so one thing you could do like, would be like think really hard about like how to differentiate through the JPEG compression function. And, like, people have done that. It takes a lot of work. You know, like, you have to do this for every particular defense that exists, and, like, that's not something that I really wanted to go into. Um, it's kind of impressive that you can do this, but um, it takes a lot of time. Uh, so instead, what I figured we, we would do is let's, like, fix gradient descent, at least for these defenses that broke it in this way. And so the way we do that uh, is, so we, we take our initial image, and <clears throat> we feed it through the classifier and get some probabilities out. Um, this is like, you know, maybe it's, I'm saying here that there's like a 40% chance it's a cat and like a 30% chance it's a dog and some other percent chance of some other classes. Now, typically what we do is we would do what's called backpropagation to obtain a gradient. And this is the direction we should travel in to make the loss function be as large as possible. Um, but what I'm going to say is that for some, some class of defenses, we can't do that because there exists some layer, maybe this purple layer here, that introduces some noise. That, that's what causes the, the loss surface to look so jagged. And so what I'm going to do is when I compute the gradient going backwards, I'm going to just completely replace that function with a new function, which is similar, but has nice gradients. And I'm just going to lie to the classifier and tell it when you compute the backward pass, this is the actual function you're computing the backward pass over. And um, it will give the wrong answer as an output. So it will get some kind of gradient that says go in this direction, it'll be misclassified. 
the answer will be wrong because it's not technically actually the gradient, um, but it will be useful. It will be sufficiently useful to the classifier so that what you end up with is you go consistently in the same direction to find an adversarial example that works. So, um, you know, there's this distinction here between like, it's not technically the gradient, but it actually gets us to the right answer. So I'm going to claim that this is a nice way of performing these kinds of attacks. Uh, and and it, this, this same exact style of approach is what, what let us break basically all of the seven defenses with some variance on it um, to, to make them work for particular defenses. Uh, um, let me take questions at the end just because I think I have time, but I want to make sure. Um, okay. So the third set of lessons um, is like on how to perform better evaluations to begin with. Um, I've given talks on this before. Um, actually, like the reason I titled this talk that is because this is a paper that's titled this. Um, it's an 18-page paper, and if you care about that, you can go read it. Uh, I figured for this talk, I'm not going to go into those details too much here. But know that if you want to perform evaluations for neural networks on like these uh, on adversarial examples, there exists a really long report on how you can do that. And I would recommend that you look at it. But if you're not actually going to do that, then don't read this. It's kind of dry. Um, OK. Uh, so um, where do I think that we're going from here now that we've sort of seen how, we're, how we've done uh, in the past? Um, so I showed you this, this sort of slide before of, of all of these attacks on these defenses. Uh, and you can think, you know, like we're in a terrible state, like everything is broken. Uh, which more or less is true, um, but the question is like, how are things going to look in the next couple of years? Um, you know, like I, I said this earlier, like you know, maybe we should just give up, um, and, and everything is just bad. Um, but let's go back to the year um, 1997 and see how things looked. Another field, um, cryptography. Uh, so, okay, um, in 1997, people were trying to come up with uh, secure block ciphers. A uh, DES had just a couple of years earlier been shown to be weak and they wanted a replacement. Um, they, were, they were gonna name the replacement AES. And so they were trying to come up with a new design for a block cipher. And so a bunch of people proposed new ciphers and then people went through and sort of just one after the other broke basically all of the top contestants sort of one after the other. Um, this is in the span of basically a year or two that they went through and just attacked all of these things. And you can think, you know, this is quite similar to where we are now. People are proposing a bunch of block ciphers. Everything's broken. And if you look how cryptography has done, like the best attack on AES today um, was published basically a decade ago and isn't actually an attack. Like it doesn't do better than brute force. And like cryptography basically worked. Like things were terrible and then they got much better. And now we haven't seen a nice attack on AES in the last decade. And so, so the question sort of is like, um, are we crypto in the 90s? Like, is, is it the, f the fact that we're going to see things get much better, and in 10 years, all of our problems are going to go away? Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to claim that we're probably not crypto in the 90s um, for two reasons. Um, so the first reason that I'm going to say that we're not crypto in the 90s um, is that, like, let's think about what it means to have an attack succeed. Uh, so in cryptography, we design things so that they're secure, um, normally, if the adversary can succeed, like, with 2 to the 128 probability, 2 to the minus 128 probability. Like, you give them 2 to the minus 128 probability of just randomly guessing your key and everything is good. And, like, cryptographer will tell you that their algorithm is completely broken if it's 2 to the minus 127. Like, you know, run for the hills, create a new algorithm from scratch. Like, that's what they did with AES, basically. Um, so, okay, this is the cryptographer's view. Uh, maybe the system security view is like things are secure if it's like two to the minus 32. You know, stack canaries, ASLR, those things work with probability roughly two to the minus 32. And to the systems person, it's broken if it's like two to the minus 20. Like if the attackers can succeed one in a million times, maybe your algorithm is broken. Um, so where are we with machine learning? Well, in machine learning, the things that worked that I called secure um, work with probability two to the minus one. Uh, so, like, the things that are effective work half of the time. And we call something broken when it works probability 2 to the 0. Like, the things that I said were broken meant that I could attack it 100% of the time. So, like, we have quite a ways to go 
before like secure actually means uh, like actually secure. Uh, yeah, so, so this is in one way like why I don't think we're near where crypto was a couple years ago. Uh, so the other reason why we're not there yet. Um, okay, so this plot is going to show you um, the success rate of a defense versus distortion. So notice, for example, that when you have no distortion, the success rate is starting off around half. So like, this is what I mean by like no attack makes you work roughly half the time. So they're bad to begin with. Um, and as we introduce perturbations, depending on which curve you look at, which variance of this defense, which, by the way, is a state-of-the-art defense called adversarial smoothing, uh, you end up um, with something that looks like this. But the problem is that if you actually look at the images that correspond to those distortion numbers, they look the same still. Like, the thing is, this image here is misclassified basically all of the time. Like, all of the classifiers have reached 0% robustness for that image. But, like, as humans, these look identical. And like, what I'd really want is to like squash that plot, like say classify this image correctly, which has like a distortion that's okay, this one's 100, these, this one here, here was four, so this is you know, 25 times larger, and I still want this one to be classified correctly. So not only do I want the distortion to be introduced 25 times larger and still make it work, I also want the, thing, the success rate to be more than 50% at this number. So like we really have, really have several orders of magnitude to go until we can actually get this thing to be there. But uh, it's actually even worse than that. Um, because so like this is the original image I was showing you. Um, this image has an L2 distortion of 75, uh, which you might think, okay, we want this one classified correctly. That, that should obviously still be a tabby cat. Um, this image here has an L2 distortion also of 75. Same metric. But like this one is not clearly a tabby cat to me. This one is. And so like not only do we not ac accurately classify these things, like we don't even know how to measure distortion. Like this is like one of the best ways we have for measuring like what it means to be robust. And we're measuring against something where like the same distance can either be something that's obviously classified still the same to us as humans, and another one that's obviously not. So, this is an active area of research of coming up with good distortion metrics. Uh, I'm hoping that in the future we'll have something good, but we don't right now. And so like maybe the claim is like we're crypto in like the 1920s. <laughs> like, like crypto pre-Shannon. Before Shannon said like, here's what information theory is. And people like went into sort of their closet and just sort of cobbled together some things and said, I have an encryption algorithm. Like that's kind of what we're doing with defenses today is we're putting some stuff together and we're saying on this synthetic metric, we can do reasonably well. But like, is that actually measuring human perception? Like, no, it's not. And so we have a long way to go, I think. But we're making slow progress. Um, and so like, to briefly conclude, um, let me just say, like, we've made a long way. We've become a long way in actually doing well for these kinds of things. Um, it used to be the case that we had no idea of anything that worked, and basically everything was broken. Um, now we know how to solve a little toy problem for a very small distortion numbers. My hope is that we can sort of learn from this, go from there, and actually eventually get to the point where we can actually solve things on problems that we actually care about. Um, that's my hope, and hopefully it will happen in the near future, but I, I do think we have a long way to go. Um, so with that, um, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So there was a question here that someone had raised during the middle. I don't remember. <laughs> okay. I, I, I was, when you were pointing about like optimizing, like, so what, like I'm sure people do this, like gradient free methods or like finite differences to yeah, yeah, go yeah, for yeah. the okay. noise. Yeah. yeah, so the question is um, there are other ways to do, do attacks than just perform gradient descent, like go down the hill. Like you can do what's called gradient free methods that don't look at the gradient or finite differences, which is a way of estimating gradients. The gradient free ones work most of the time, the finite differences ones don't work because. Like, it's not that we've broken the gradient itself, we've made the loss surface really ugly. And so the finite differences will just recover the actual gradient, which isn't helpful. But the gradient-free methods are good. Yeah, it depends on, depends on the step size. You'd have to set the, set the step size quite large, and then it works. Yes, it, it is all tuning, but yes. Um, so th this does work when you make it large enough. Um, and yeah, then you're fine. 
so I was thinking a little bit about the instability of this neural network, right? You make a small change and the label, the predicted label becomes completely different. Are there metrics to look at that 3D plot and show, you know, what is, what is the greatest drop off in any given direction? Because that gives you a measure of how susceptible you may be. Yeah, so is there a way to measure how, what the greatest drop could be in, for any point? So the reason this is hard um, is in some sense what you're doing here is you need to find an adversarial example to compute which is the worst case direction. Because computing random directions doesn't help you that much. Uh, and so you need to find the adversarial example to compute the worst case direction. And computing the adversarial example is generally tricky when defenses make things look ugly. And that's really the core of the problem, is that finding which direction is adversarial is most of the hard problem. And if we knew a way to do that easily, then we would like have good attacks. Um, so I would like it, but I, I think it's a little hard. Yeah, awesome talk. Um, uh, so I, I actually, this is more of like a, a sort of your opinion kind of thing. But okay. so I was at NURPS and uh, I went to a couple of the posters that were doing, you know, adversarial certification and things like this. And um, you know, I, I remember asking this one grad student, uh, you know, <laughs> it was probably an unfair question at the time, but they happen to be using like L infinity norms, right? And I asked them, you know, why why L infinity, right? And I think it's it's to exact the the point that you're bringing up here, right? But I, I guess the underlying question or the opinion I'd like to get from you, right, is like, how do you start to steer the research community away from these arbitrary sort of metrics? Because the, the way that I see it is a lot of these papers use the metrics as like, a, oh, well, we're doing better because, you know, paper Y did L infinity norm and now we're going to use L infinity norm and we're doing better than that, right? So there's like this benchmarking that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you had any opinions on how you even start to move the, the community in a more sane direction. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a hard question. Uh, it's the right question. So, in, so let, me, let me first make the statement that I do think that working on small norms is helpful um, for the time being. Um, the reason why I'm going to say this is like we need something to measure on. Um, we need to like pick some problem that we think we can solve. I mean, this is how research goes. You pick the toy problem that we don't have the answer to and you work really hard on that problem until you get the answer, and then you pick another problem and try on hard on that problem and get the answer there, and eventually you find, like, here's what's true generally, and hopefully you can expand to everything that's true. Um, it would be better if we had great metrics, um, and if we come up with good metrics, then I think people should switch immediately to the better metrics. Okay, so towards your question, how do we convince people to switch to better metrics? I think the first thing we need to do is come up with better metrics. Um, <laughs> Because they don't really currently exist. Um, like, people have been trying to say, like, maybe I could do like structural similarity or like these, these other kinds of distance metrics in perceptual space. They're all really, really confined to do one thing. Um, for attack research, this is fine. Like, as the attacker, um, I can pick any metric that makes human visual systems like think the images are the same and show that I can do an attack there and everything is good. Um, the defender has a much harder job. They need to say that for all metrics where the human visual system agrees these images are the same, um, like, it's hard. And I don't think we have a good answer there. The one thing I'll say though is that in some other domains, we don't care about what the human visual system thinks. Uh, so take malware classification. In malware classification, it doesn't matter if the person who's analyzing the binary thinks the program is malicious. Like, either it's going to delete your hard drive or it's not. And, like, if when you run it, it has malicious behavior, then it's malicious. And if when you run it, it doesn't have malicious behavior, then it's not. And the only thing that matters is, like, how much work the person has to put in to, like, change from one class to the other. And here's a case where, like, there is no metric. It, like, doesn't really matter how much distortion you introduce. The only thing that matters is how much work you have to put into making the change. And that case, we might be able to quantify better because I think we have a better understanding of, of what it means to make changes to like in the malware case. But, um, you know, I, I definitely hear your question that um, I would love great um, distance metrics, but I don't think we have um, the perfect one yet. I have two questions. Um, the first is, do you feel like defending against adversarial examples is just fundamentally intractable? Because in higher dimension feature space, you just have these huge swaths 
of adversarial subspaces. And my second question is, would ensembles be kind of a way to go to kind of decrease the intersection of these adversarial subspaces? Yeah, okay. So the first question is like, is it intractable? Uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, no. And the reason why I can say that is because I have an existence proof of a, a classifier that gets it right, which is all of us. Like, we are humans, and, and like, we can classify these images correctly. I don't know how we do it, but like, there exists some method that we use to look at those images and say they're the same. Um, so I don't think it's intractable. It may be computationally intractable. Um, it may be very, like, something that like, is very, very, very hard to do computationally, but like, at least we know something can do it. Um, yeah, so the, the other question of um, do ensembles help there, the answer is a little trickier. So, so like you would think that they would. Like it sort of makes sense that like you sort of take a bunch of different classifiers trained in different ways, you stack them all together, and you only give the prediction if they all give the same output. Um, unfortunately, it turns out there's this thing called transferability, which um, says that adversarial examples that work on one classifier tend to also work on other classifiers. It's really kind of confusing. We don't have a great explanation for it. There's been some recent papers that propose some plausible explanations. Uh, but the problem like, is even true across machine learning classifiers. So it turns out adversarial examples on neural networks also fool gradient boosted decision trees, also fool k nearest neighbors. Like, even across like, different types of classifiers, you can find adversarial examples that fool them all simultaneously. It takes a little more work and it increases the distortion a little bit, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Okay, so the question is, is this assuming the same feature space? Uh, so this assumes the same representation of like pixels as inputs. People have started attacking classifiers that use different feature spaces, but I haven't yet seen a paper that takes a different feature space, like takes SIFT features, attacks that, and shows that transfers to a neural network. I don't know the answer there. Yeah. Great talk. When I saw your... Uh the image, I instantly thought back to like dimensions that I can understand, like three dimensions and things like that, and how the textured one was kind of security through obscurity by just kind of noising up the thing, and then obviously it's still the same thing. Has anyone done any work with lower dimensional feature spaces where you can do all the partial derivatives and figure it out and say this is truly robust for this classification? Yeah, okay, so have people done things on lower dimensions where they can say like this is truly robust? Um, so there's a whole line of work so this is not directly answering your question. I'll get back to it in a second. There's a whole line of work on certified defenses, which are defenses which are provably robust under some particular distance metric, uh, under some particular distance. Where like they say, like if you introduce an L infinity perturbation less than like 0.1, like the classification decision won't change 90% of the time. Like the plot I showed you of like those many curves, that was on a certified defense that like was provably robust with those curve lines. No attacker in the world is going to make those go down. Um, the problem with these is that they tend not to scale that well, where uh, the curves are correct, but the, if, if you sort of want to make them grow to be really large, it turns out to be really hard. Like as you increase the dimension exponentially, things get much harder. Um, so yes, it exists, but it takes a lot of work. I mean, I do have hope that um, we'll be able to scale some of these defenses. So like these. Um, there's this line of work on certified smoothing and, and that builds on this work called pixel DP. And that's currently the state of the arts. Um, and it's substantially better than it was like a year and a half ago today. Um, and I think it's gone up by maybe an order of magnitude or two. And so uh, you can hope that like over the next year or two, maybe we'll get that again. But um, yeah. So as humans, we see faces in Mars. We see Bigfoot in forests. Do we need to look at more fuzzy boundaries than just a hard classification? Yeah, um, right. So do we need to have fuzzy boundaries? I, th I think it is a necessary component. So any classifier, so um, imagine I took a classifier that, ha that looks at big images and like ImageNet, which is like what, the, what that cat was drawn from, um, has a thousand classes. There are only a thousand things it knows about. So if you were to show it, one of the things that it doesn't know about it is going to give you an answer. And the answer will by definition be wrong because it is not one of the things it knows how to give an answer for. And so like, it is clearly necessary 
that the classifiers will have to be able to say, I don't know what this is. Because if you can't say, I don't know, then when you show it something it's never seen before, it will get it wrong. Um, is it sufficient to do that? That's a much harder question. I think the answer there is no. I think that just adding these fuzzy decision boundaries, some people have tried to do this, um, won't work. Part of the reason why is that how do you teach the classifier what it doesn't know? Like what the currently existing approaches basically do is they add a background class of like all of the other stuff. And then they say like this is the no, this is the I don't know class. But like what happens when you add an image that's not present in the background class of things it hasn't seen before and now you get another new image and it randomly assigns it to one of the labels which is probably the wrong thing. But yeah. So this is more of a comment but I just want to get your thoughts on this. So we've been comparing um, how humans perform in terms of classifying like, you know, an image versus like, you know, how we could try to do it with a computer or whatever. But my concern is that when we talk about humans, that's only just three dimensions, right? So my, my concern is that even though we're good at looking at things in three dimensions, that may not be the case. Because you, you were saying before that, you know, your assertion that, uh, that we exist as a classifier that can do things really well in three dimensions. But my concern is that in larger dimensions, we don't know about that, right? Because all we know is three dimensions in terms of what we can see. And so that's my kind of concern is that, and in the higher dimensions, whether human or not, that that may not be tractable. We don't know that answer. That's kind of my point. Yeah. I was no, this is definitely the case. Um, there are things that humans aren't good at um, and that humans are, should not be the oracle for. Again, made by Balboa classification. Like, the human is, is not the oracle there, and, and most humans are bad at it. Um, the only reason I mention humans for vision is because um, here we know that the machine learning does poorly. We know that humans can do really well, really easily. I mean, you ask a three-year-old what the picture of the cat was, and they're going to say it's a cat. Like, you don't need, like, we, we don't need to, like, train the person, like, in, like, any, like, intentional way to recognize cats. Like, you just have the person, they live their life for the first couple of years, and then they can say that's a cat. Um, and, like, somehow that happens. And we don't know how that happens. And machine learning, like, we, like, intentionally try and make it really good at doing cats, and even then it can't do that problem. Um, there was this talk by um, Ben Recht, which, um, where he says, like, what generalization means, like, differs to different people. Like, so in most people, if you, like, say, like, let's, in, like, in humans, what does generalization mean? It means, like, you teach someone to, like, hit a baseball off of, like, you know, off of the tee, and they'll generalize to be able to hit the baseball when someone throws it at them. Um, in machine learning, what it means is, like, if you can hit a baseball thrown by a particular person at a particular place, then, like, the next time they do that exact same thing, they'll be able to hit that baseball. Like, that's what generalization means to machine learning people. So, like, it's really, like, a big gap between, like, what humans do and what machine learning does. Nicholas, uh, I have a question. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up sort of the fundamental nature of a metric and how important this is. I think there's a lot of us in this room who when people talk about their L2 balls, we want to drop kick that L2 ball, right? Um, what, what, in your, uh, what would you provide as guidance if we want to do research on appropriate metrics in security, in human in, in vision, or whatever? What, what are those? So, so for example, I think in the 2000s, everybody acknowledged that PSNR for image quality and restoration was wrong, so they, they did structural similarity metrics and whatnot, and those are bad, right? So what, what are... For, for adversarial learning and defenses, what, what are sort of the parameters of what a metric needs to look like? I have no idea. Uh, like, could it, be, could it be an empirical model? Could it be, does it need to be mathematically rigorous? Like what? Yeah, right. I really think that for like each domain, experts in that domain are going to have to think really hard about what the metric means. It would be nice if like computer vision people were to sit down and, and think really carefully, get together with a bunch of people who do um, the like human perceptual analysis and like really try and come up with some good metrics. The problem with metrics, like, so most of the metrics that exist for measuring distortion are there because not to measure adversarial distance, but to measure how good compression works. Like that's why mo most image um, similarity metrics exist, so that you can judge whether your, your, like your MP3, or, sorry, MP4 compression for your movie is, um, is good enough. Um, now, the problem with those metrics is that they don't perfectly capture human perceptual similarity, which means if you were to use them for adversarial evaluations, then like, the adversary is going to game the metric into producing a small number that's not actually small for a human. And like, 
bad things happen. And so like, not only do we need good metrics that like, are good on average case images, which is hard enough, we need good metrics that are accurate on the boundary images, which is even harder. Um, so yeah, in the case of images, I have no idea. I, I have hope that in other domains, where like the set of what we can do is smaller, um, again, I'll come back to malware classification. Um, we might be able to have people sit down and say, here are the types of changes that it's really hard for an adversary to do. Like if you, if you told me you need to rewrite the entire text segment, that's hard. Um, if you told me you need to like flip this one bit or like add a new no-op function, that's trivial. Uh, so like it would be nice in some domains to like go through and categorize the costs of the adversary for doing different things. And I think in some domains we can do it. I, I don't know the answer for images. Wonderful. Let us thank our keynote speaker one more time. Thank you, Nicholas.